they wanted my comments on them, on some of them. They wanted to know um, basically what um, my um, take on it was. Um, several uh, reports that I read were mediocre. Uh, the ones that, uh, that made uh, my pique my interest were the ones about Admiral Byrd mm. and uh, things of that nature. So can you tell us about some of the reports that you read on, on Admiral Byrd? I read, his, I read his original diary, the one that uh, uh, the, the true diary, not the one floating around the internet. Was this original copy of the diary? The original copy. What did yes. it look like? What did it look like? It was in the form of a flight log. Oh. So his diary was written into his flight log? Yes, As it a pilot, was. He would keep a log. Yes, he would. <clears throat> Let's go back a little bit. Um, okay. Because you didn't, you didn't just happen into a job at Area 51. There's a, no. There's a bit no. of history behind there, isn't there? Oh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of history behind that. Um, well, when I was um, age, at the age of 12, I had, a little, I had an incident occur about uh, when I was in the, the Scouts. And it had to do with um, uh, being picked up by a saucer, or UFO, if you want to call it that. And uh, it was uh, quite an interesting uh, uh, event. <laughs> you want to tell us a little bit about what happened? I can tell you the whole thing if you want. Sure, let's go. Let's go. Um, well, me and my friend were on our way back from the uh, uh, scout meeting. And uh, we got to the edge of the, uh, our, the cornfield that goes for about a mile before you get to the house. And then there's a road that goes around it. And I told my friend, I said, well, I'm going to take a shortcut through the cornfield because it's shorter. He said, well, I'm going to keep going around the road because, you know, it, the corn stalks look like they're going to reach down and grab you. So he's kind of finicky about not wanting to do that. So I, went, I said, fine. I'm, I parted with him. He went on around the road, and I went through the cornfield. Uh, halfway through the cornfield, I looked up, and I saw what looked like a star. But it got brighter, and it got brighter, and it got brighter. And then the next thing I realized was the entire area I was standing in was lit up just like daylight. You could, so bright, you could actually see the kernels on the corn. That's pretty bright. Um, I looked up and I, into this light, and I heard a voice come from it. It says, Billy, we are here to take you on a journey if you would like to go. And I said, yes. Without hesitation, I said, sure, let's go. Next thing I know, I'm looking down, and the ground's going further away, and I'm getting lifted up into this craft. And um, so, next thing I know, I'm inside this craft. And they asked me, what do I see? I said, it's, all I see is bright light. And they toned it down to where I could see my surroundings. And everything was in a, in a circular pattern around inside this vessel. And the people were extremely tall. Um, by I mean, and by standards for a, 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 a child, extremely tall can be anywhere from six feet on up. But these people were way up there. Um, what did they look like? Uh, like you or me, except very tall in stature. Uh, the female was um, somewhere between, I would say, between 10 to 12 feet. And the man was taller than that. Uh, and they spoke with very gently. And uh, they said, um, all right, uh, how good are you with in, in geography? And I said, straight A student. And they said, we'd like you to tell us where we are as we go over the different uh, states. And we, the one we left from was Texas, Wichita Falls, Texas. So that's fine. We started going over the, the different uh, country, uh, different states, uh, different flags, and I recognized the flags as we went over them. And I started naming them off. 
and uh, we got up to Canada and the Canadian flag and uh, they said where are we now and I said I don't know we're over ice and snow and uh, I said yes we're uh, above Canada we're in the Arctic Circle you said flags you could see the flags yes where through the bottom of the craft you can look down through the craft which was transparent and you could see uh, passing over these cities and it was quite interesting now before we continue on the story, I, I want to go back to the cornfield for a second. Yeah, okay. What what time of year was it? Was it fall? Fall. Okay. Yeah. And, and as you were being brought up into the crowd, what was that sensation like? Like a lifting, uh, just just suddenly weightless. Um, it's like the gravity around my body was defied, and I was pulled into the crowd. And did you were you pulled in from the bottom, from the side? From the from the bottom. From the bottom. Yeah. Were there doors? Didn't seem like no doors. It looked like I was going right into a solid bottom, but I went right through it. Interesting. And then you mentioned the light. Is that what you came into, was solid light? Yes. The bright white light, they asked you? What did I see? And I said, nothing but bright light. And then they toned it down. Okay, thank you. And then they turned it down. Okay. So the flags that you saw as you were flying over the States, what was your altitude? Very low. You weren't that high at all. No, we weren't high at all. Was this daytime? It was nighttime. At the night. It was night. So where were these flags? They were well they're, they're, uh, on the buildings that we passed over. Um, we we passed over um, from Texas. Went to uh, passed over through Oklahoma, the Oklahoma flag. And then they um, um, went up from there to um, the state above um, Oklahoma. Um, I have to have a map to tell okay. you which ones they are. So do you recall any landmarks? Landmarks, yeah, the, the buildings are came with more like the capitals. Okay, um, so you're flying over the capitals then? Mm -hmm. So you're on the craft and you're you're heading yes. out over Canada. Right. What Northeast over the, we 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 went over um, like Baffin Bay, um, and Canada. So you know we were, we were by that time I'm I'm totally lost. I don't know where we are. And they said, "Do you see the glow ahead of us?" And I said, "Yes, I do." What is that? And they said, "That's the entrance to Hollow Earth." Hmm. I said, hollow earth, I said, wait a minute, we're taught in school that the earth is solid and it has a molten core and all this, and now you're telling me it's hollow? And they said, yes, it is hollow. And they said, what you learn is, is a shame because it's, it's all a lie. And I said, okay, uh, how long are we going to be gone on this trip? And they said, you're going to be gone for six earth months. Six and I months. said, six months? I'll be grounded for life. <laughs> that was my thought, you know. Uh, and they said, no, you won't be grounded for life. They says you'll be uh, missed, yes, but when you return, your, your body will be replenished and all the uh, childhood diseases or sicknesses that you were experiencing will be gone. What, what sicknesses were you experiencing at the time? Well, the, like the mumps, the measles, and stuff like this. But uh, at the time, um, they said that uh, you know, your, your immune system is starting to break down. It must be replenished. Okay. And uh, that was one of the reasons for, the, for the going for the trip. So you didn't have the mumps and the measles? and all the stuff at the no. same time at that moment. It no. It was just that what they're telling you. It was a fortification against it. Okay. And, they, and they fortified my body. They gave me a, a, a liquid to drink, which was tasted like grape juice, but it's very sweet. And I drank it. And it tasted extremely well. And it just it, it energized my body as I drank it. Were, were you ill when they picked you up? No, I didn't think I was ill. Okay. They said that um, there were... Uh, that my immune, the immune system was uh, had started to deteriorate, and that they needed to reinforce it. Okay. So you see the light ahead. What happened? I see the light ahead, and we got closer and closer to it, 
And as we started to curve into it, I said, that's a hole. And they said, yes, that's a hole. And uh, so we went on, went into the hole. Uh, we landed at a, at a, a city um, inside. And uh, they said, do you know where you are? And I said, no. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming inside hollow earth. And they said, yes, you are. Tell me about the city. The city was not like a city on the surface. The cities on the surface are skyscrapers. You know, big tall buildings and all this. And the inside, they're, they're, all the buildings are round. They don't have roofs on them, but they're round. And uh, they're built in and around Mother Nature. They're not, uh, you don't see any highways or uh, sidewalks or anything like this. It's all stru round structures in and around nature. With no roofs. With no roofs. What were they made of? It, it looked like a marble type substance, but yet it could, I don't think it was marble. I think it was more like crystal. So smooth? It's very smooth. Reflective? Very reflective. Okay. And uh, we, we landed and of course I started walking around. And uh, I met several different beings, people, and uh, some of them uh, announced that they were from the surface. Well, you mentioned the light going up. Yes. Did you look up once you landed? Yes, and I saw a sun that never moved. What color was it? It was more uh, between an orange and a yellow. Could you feel the heat coming from it? Uh, a heat, yeah, more like a more a soft heat. It wasn't harsh at all. It wasn't bright either. It was uh, very easy on the eyes. So is there any time of day on the surface that you'd say would be similar to that kind of a lighting effect? Twilight, maybe. Twilight? Yeah. When, when the sun starts dropping down. When you look up, can you see beyond this light and see surface on the other side? As you look at, as you look outward, you see the, the horizon rise like this instead of straight across. You see, actually see a curve, a curve upward. Are there clouds? No, no clouds. Where does the water come from? Does it rain? It mists in the, from the sky but it is not like a harsh rain like it is here. The clouds, um, the clouds up here are very thick. And, um, and in essence, what they have, do they have, sometimes they have a, a cloud once in a while in the, in the sky, but it's more of a very, uh, like a translucent looking through it. Very, very uh, not dense at all. Very light, so and, and and the atmosphere was so exuberating, um, so refreshing, and pure. It was like it was breathing air that just had no uh, smell or taste or anything like like it does up here. Any uh, uh, like. Um, up here around cities, you just you, you breathe the air and you, you you breathe that smog and stuff. Nothing like that there, at all. No, it was just the purest smell, uh, purest um, energy. When you when you breathe it, you're just energized totally. Okay, so you met some people. Yes, I did. Some from the surface. I met one individual. It was a female. Uh, she was. Um, rather tall, but, um, and I looked at her and I, her, her face looked familiar. And I told her, you look familiar. And she said, uh, I should be familiar. I'm Amelia Earhart. What year was this? Hmm? You were 12 years old, what year was this? I'm 12 years old, well, let me, get, let me think back here. I was born, uh, the, uh, brought to the surface in 51. Um, Let's see. 63, 64? 60, yep, six, between 63, 64, somewhere in that range. Um, have, anybody got a calculator? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's in that range there somewhere. Um, when, I was, when, me, when me and my sister were brought to the surface, 
we were brought to the surface not as babies, but as toddlers. We'll come back to that story yeah. about how that all started. Let's, let's right. finish this one. You met Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart. I also met a group of gentlemen that were, um, they were dressed in robes, but they were uh, aviators as well. And um, they had, uh, I didn't recognize them, but they were, were talking to me because they knew I was from the surface. Um, they said that, uh, I said, well, who are you? And they said, we were, we were Navy pilots. And, uh, uh, and our aircraft disappeared off of the, the, off the Bermuda Triangle. So, um, so you met these pilots, they, they were lost in the Bermuda Triangle? Yes. They were, Do you remember their names? Their names? Sure. No, I remember their, uh, their flight they were talking about, Flight 19, mm -hmm. off of Muscle Shoals, Florida. That was Flight 19. Do you know what year Flight 19 got lawed? It was back in 47 or 40, no, 45 or 47, I'm not quite so sure exactly. So probably 1964. Yeah. Were they looking like some really old guys? No, very young. So are you saying when you go into the, the hollow earth? You don't age. You don't age. There is no age. Um, it's not like, we well, see, time is an illusion. Even up here, it's an illusion, but people still have followed, go by it. <laughs> but um, it's really down there. It's like how do you explain it? Is everyone looks young? You know, they don't look old. You don't see people walking around with white hair and white beards. They're all very, very young looking. Do you, th you think, it's, you suppose it's because, because of the place itself, or is it because of the people? I think it's because of a little bit of both, a little bit because of the place and because of the people. The place is indigenous to, um, to immortality or to longevity. Uh, everything I saw down there was huge in size. I mean, even insects flying through the air were huge. They weren't small little insects. They were quite large. So do the mosquitoes? Dragonflies come flying by about six foot across. Didn't see any mosquitoes, no. I was going to ask, <laughs> you know, are, are the mosquitoes, the mosquitoes have feathers and do they carry you away? <laughs> no, <Yes>. no. <laughs> mosquitoes with feathers? I don't think so, no. Well, you know, there's that saying, the mosquitoes are so big down there that... Uh, They'll carry you off, anyhow. No, okay. Uh, the creatures were large. Uh, the insects were large. The the, the people were large. The uh, looking, uh, I looked up and I saw a flying pterodactyl. And of course, that just didn't register too well. But and uh, and I said, Wait, that's that's a pterodactyl. And they said, Yes, it is. And I said, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I saw dinosaurs. Which ones did you see? Well, I saw the pterodactyl in the air, and I saw a T-Rex um, walk by. And, uh, of course, T-Rex is a vegetarian. It's not a, a flesh-eating animal. Really? With all those teeth? Those that's, for, that's for ripping and tearing plants, not ripping and tearing flesh. So, aren't they, wouldn't they be wild? I mean, it, it seems kind of a dangerous situation. Well, it's, well, it's not dangerous at all. Everybody down there speaks with telepathy. That's the, that's the norm. So what does that have to do with the dinosaurs not being dangerous? The dinosaurs speak with telepathy as well. So you're telling me that you can talk to the dinosaurs? Yes, you can. You can talk to the trees, you can talk to the dinosaurs, you can talk to plants, whatever, and you get a response. T-Rexes are kind of a big animal. Yeah, they are. Are there accidents? Does a T-Rex maybe accidentally kick an inhabitant or step on one? Or No, they don't step on nobody. Or sit on one maybe? I've seen people sit on a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> sit on a chihuahua? <laughs> I, I saw somebody do it once accidentally. The chihuahua wasn't 
too thrilled with that, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. With something that's small in relation to something so large, it's easy not to catch. Well, they're, 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 they, when they walk, they're very meticulous in where they walk. Okay. Okay, enough about the dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> So you saw a lot of very large things down here. A lot of very large. You met these pilots. Yes. Uh, Amelia Earhart. Yep. What happened next? Um, then they, they they had me go into a room, uh, actually a building, another in one of the round buildings. They had me uh, sit down on, in a chair, and um, this mist, uh, bluish mist, came down over top over me, and I said, "What's this?" And they said, "You're being detoxified." Uh, decontaminated. Uh, all the impurities that are in your body are being taken out. And so your immune system will be fortified when you return home uh, to the surface. And uh, I said, well, I don't really want to go. <laughs> I want to stay here. And they said, yes, we know you want to stay here, but uh, you're not staying here. What was compelling you to want to stay there? Was it any It just felt, or? it's the beauty of everything around you. I mean, everything is so not what it is on the surface. Um, when you look out in, in, on the surface, what do you see? You see cars, you see planes flying over and causing, you know, vapor trails behind them and the sky's not clear, and the sky, the sky smells strange, or, or taste, you can actually taste the, the air here. It's just not there. <laughs> you know? All that's not there, it's all pure. Everything is pure, and it's in, everything's in harmony. Um, I didn't hear any, uh, you know, I didn't hear any bad language while I was there. Um, nobody spoke as you would speak, it was all from communication, mind to mind. It was really, really wonderful feeling. So in that communication, mind to mind, are you, are you hearing a voice in your head, or is it something different? It's more or less like a communication from their mind to my mind. You can do it on the surface, too. You just have to sit down and get, um, get away from all the distractions which is really hard on the surface because you've got all these distractions, you know, every come from all different directions. But if you were to get out with Mother Nature and just be quiet and get and turn your cell phones off and all this, all these economies that you like, uh, devices, then you could communicate telepathically. But you get so caught up in the mundane world that uh, you lose sight of it. Uh, you, you, it's just like it's too many distractions to to really communicate up here through telepathy. It's easier to talk, but talking, I think, is what got man in trouble in the first place. <laughs> so you get sprayed with this blue mist. Yes, and then after that, um, they said uh, you're free to travel wherever you want to travel and uh, we'll uh, be with you a little bit, a little bit later on. Uh, we'll take you to the learning centers and uh, re-educate you again. And uh, so I was able to you know, freely walk around and talk to people and talk to beings. I saw several different type of races there. Um, um, the uh, besides the uh, Aryanians, I saw the uh, Lemurians. I saw the um, um, the insectoids. They look like mantis almost, similar to a mantis. They don't have six legs, but they have uh, two appendages they walk on, and then the uh, uh, appendages for uh, uh, for hands are not really hands. They're like uh, uh, pinchers, almost, and they talk with telepathy. And they're not very—they're not very short, not very tall either. They're in between, about uh, between four and five feet tall, 
and they, their, their heads look just like a praying mantis. But uh, their, legs, their two, intelligence. Two legs, two arms. Yeah, two legs, two arms. And they fly, <laughs> of course. They have wings. Mm -hmm. But uh, they do communicate telepathically in English, and well, they, they know all languages. It's like when my father, some, sometimes when I'm channeling my, when I channel my father at different times, uh, when he is speaking to a big group of people, a lot of times there's people there that are not from America, or not from, you know, the local area, but yet they pick up on everything he's saying and they understand it. It's sort of like he's, he, he's speaking English, but yet people, some people that are present from another foreign country that don't speak very good English, they hear the message in their own language. So it's like when and he has that ability when he, when he talks that people from another country can still understand him. So the, the telepathic communication sounds like you're hearing the words in your head in, yes. in the English language. Yes. For somebody else listening to the same telepathic communication. It would be in, this. in their language. So it's like when people, they ask, well, what language do you speak under there? All language. Plain and simple. He speaks, they understand. No matter where they're from. So you got to the travel you said? Yeah, I got to travel. travel. How did you travel? Uh, well, you don't walk around that much because they, they like to, uh, no, they don't want to harm the, the Mother Earth at all. They fly around on, some, on these um, platforms that are above the ground and um, so you, 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 you get up and step on one and it uh, radiates with your, with your vibration and it to actually talk to you by name, um, Billy, where would you like to go? You know, what city would you like to go to? And it's like it felt like a taxi. Kind of like a taxi, except free. <laughs> so what are you standing on? You say it's above the ground. It's, it's a platform. Like, when you say it, what shape is it? Is it it's round. It's round. Yeah. It's like a frisbee, a big frisbee you stand on. You, yeah, you might call it a frisbee or a, 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 a saucer-shaped craft that you don't sit inside of a bubble or anything like that. You sit on this um, platform, uh, stand on this platform, and it has a ring, uh, 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 another ring that once you step into it, this, this ring appears around you, around the entire uh, disc, and you're basically inside this uh, uh, enclosure. And uh, you think the direction you want to go, you go that way. Yeah, I would ask when you first describe it, you know, is there a possibility of falling off the thing? No, you cannot fall off it. Is, it, is the ring solid? Is there like a, a handhold? I mean, well, when you step onto the, onto the, 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 pl the platform, you have the, the ring that you're standing on, or the platform you're standing on, which is round, and then once you step onto it, with the, then this other ring comes up from the main part up to about mid-waist area, and just stays right there. It keeps you on the craft, and you, you can't fall off it. It's then like you can just like a hand railing. It's like a handrail almost. What holds the hand railing up? You see, it, comes it up just comes the up from the craft and, and hovers right there. There's nothing, no visible means of support. So can you pass your hand between the rail and, and the yes, you can. Underneath? If you wanted to jump from it, could you? I imagine you could, but why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I want to fully understand this transportation system. Yeah. Uh, so some people are pretty daring, you know. Maybe they want to. You know, there's some base jumpers out there that might want to take that. Oh uh, well, it doesn't. It's not that high above the ground. If they jump out, they're going to land on the ground. Yeah, could I bungee jump from it? I wouldn't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. That's about six foot off the ground. Why would you want to bungee jump a oh, six, six foot? Feet, okay. <laughs> well, you know, no, these are these are, these are uh, conveyances that keep you on close to the ground. Okay, so um, not nature; it's close to the ground. I'm envisioning right. the Jetsons, you know, we're flying off. And <laughs> okay, yeah, I understand. But no, these are like little platforms. 
And um, then they also have these other pl other devices that uh, are more of a, like a scout craft, which is something you get inside of. Uh, once you're inside it, it automatically calls you by name and asks where you wish to go. Uh, if you wish to go to another star system or uh, another planet or whatever, uh, it, 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 they can they it can take you there. So travel is not just within. The sphere, no, the it's not. Earth, you can go anywhere. everywhere, everywhere. Oh. So these little scout craft. Yeah. Are they just parked hither and there, and just if you need one, you can grab one. You just get on it and go. Are there parking areas for these little scout craft? Well, they're all hovering above the ground. How big are they? The little scout craft are anywhere from about um, 150 feet in diameter which is not that small, it's not that big either. Sure. But it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a sports craft. It looks similar to the one that uh, Bob Lazar spoke of. But uh, well, my father's craft is uh, a lot larger, about, well, about, about 10 times as large. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hovered, it, it stationed above the, uh, uh, in the vicinity of the North Polar opening. So, okay, we'll get to him in a minute. The question okay. I have about that, yeah. we, you, you channeled him last night, and he just came yes. from monitoring the opening. Did he monitor the opening from the craft? Yes. Okay. So, wow, well, 150 foot in diameter sport about, craft. About 45 feet high. 45 feet high. Yeah. Um, do you travel in groups with these things? You just, if you need one, it's just like one guy who can go? Is there a fueling station you got to put gas in this thing? It okay. doesn't take gas. Okay. What, how does it operate? Runs off of the electromagnetism of the Earth. Okay. So it's free energy? Free energy. Etheric energy? So you could call it that, yeah. Vortex energy? <laughs> vortex energy. You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey. No, I won't say vortex energy, okay. no. Yeah, just trying to understand the terms. So it's, yeah. Uh, all right. So. Where did you travel to during the six months? You can go anywhere. Where did you go? I travel all over the in, inside of the planet. Um, the different cities. Um, and of course, I went to one city that we, of Yeyu, and uh, that looked familiar to me right away. I mean, I, I, the surroundings and everything were so familiar. And um, uh, it was like I knew where to go. It was, it was sort of like it was um, deja vu, if you will. Been there before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so had you been there before? Uh, I'd be, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about the rest of your experience uh, during the six months in Hollow Earth, or would you like to transition into your origins? Well, the after the six month period was over, they uh, they approached me and they said it's time for you to return back to the surface. And I said, okay, um, but do I have to go? <laughs> and he said, yes, you must return um, because you have a mission. And of course, that, that, was my, that was the first time I was told about a mission. So uh, we, they returned me to the surface. Well, can you tell us what the mission was? I didn't know at that moment. Ah, okay. Um, or at least I had, I had, no, I had no, no recollection of it at that, mo at that time. But um, they brought me back to the surface. They dropped me off in the cornfield again. The same, the same way that you arrived, uh, weightless? Well, well the, yeah, same, same way. They dropped me off in the cornfield, and I went walking on and jumped the fence over and started walking up to the house. This plain clothesman stand, was standing there, and he goes, who are you? And I said, Billy. Billy? And I said, yes, Billy. I live here. I said, guys, call up a search. He's back. <laughs> Everybody runs out to me, and they start asking me where I've been. And I'm going, scout meeting. My friend jumps the fence, runs over to me. He says, that was six months ago. I go, what? He said, six, I said, six months ago? No, no, no not really, couldn't be. He goes, yeah, that was six months ago. Where have you been? I'm going, 
I don't know. My my memory was wiped. Uh, so when you were in the Hollow Earth, was yes. six, did it feel like six? You were there for six months. It didn't. It didn't feel like any time at all. Okay. Because there's no time. Okay. You really can't. I mean, it, a, a period of existence had passed, but as far as time, you know, there's, it's a continuous day, so how can it be time? Make sense? Yes. I mean, think yes about and it. Yes no, I mean. Yes and no. Well, you, you, you ha you're inside a planet where there's no night at all. It's a continuous day. So you really can't judge a time. Do you sleep? Rest you can, yeah, you don't have to, but you, a lot of people do rest, but a lot of people don't. And it's, let's see, well, a day in a life in the hollow earth, that'd be, a, that, that, that's an experience. Um, <laughs> um, well, I rested because I was used to resting, but um, it was just like an inbred thing. You automatically gonna, you know, lay down and rest. Um, and the thing in the planet, you, you don't have beds like you do on the surface. This thing is round; it hovers above the floor, and it's uh, soft. So you lay on it, and it's comfortable. Um, and you rest, and then you get up okay. and go about what you want to do. <laughs> so, so getting back to meeting up with your uh, friend that was yeah. six months ago, like right. in a way, because you, you had your mind wiped, as you said. Yeah. What happened after that? Well, they started asking me all kinds of questions, and uh, they said, uh, sit down in the chair here, we're going to give you a, a shot, sodium pentothal. So, who was giving you this sodium pentothal? Uh, the black, the plain clothesmen that were at the house. What? They they were ready. They had sodium. They were carrying sodium pentothal with them. Well, they opened up a briefcase and they said we would like to uh, give you this shot that will help you to recollect where you've been. Doesn't that seem unusual for a plain clothesman to have sodium pentothal in a briefcase? Uh, well, not just that. They were they also put me into hypnosis. They wanted to make sure that they were getting the, 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 the full story. Um, after I had, after I'd come out of the, uh, uh, the grogginess from it, I said, did you remember anything? And I said, no, because I wasn't about to tell them yes, but I had. I, everything had been brought back. The sodium pentothal caused that? All caused it to, yeah, caused the, all the memory to come back and uh, of my trip and everything else, but I didn't say anything to them because I didn't want to be put under, uh, I didn't want to be taken away from my home. Mm -hmm. And I knew that probably what would happen if I said yes. So this, I said no, and they, so they played it back for me. And uh, it was interesting because when I came out of the, 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 the state that I was in, I was looking at them and then all their mouths were you know, just, just totally. What did they play back for you? Did it they played back the tapes. Audio, video. Audio tapes. Audio yes. tapes. Audio tapes on a spool, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a reel -to -reel recorder, reel-to-reel -reel. -reel recorder, and they played all this back. And they said, "Do you recollect any of this?" And I said, "No." You know, I was lying, of course. I knew. I knew everything, but uh, it had all been brought back to me. And I just kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to be taken away from my home. But from that point on, I knew something was different. And, and they, of course, they checked me over medically. Uh, doctors checked me out. And they said, we got a problem here, you guys. And what's the problem? Uh, this child has no bacteria in the body at all. None. And they said, that's impossible. <laughs> well, it might be impossible, but that's the way it is. 
<laughs> so, and uh, they said, well, uh, and then of course they, in my knapsack that I had a hat on my back, they pulled out this container made of a metal they had never seen before. They opened it up and they asked me what it was and I said grape juice and they analyzed it. Is this the drink that they gave you on the crowd? Uh, no, this was, they had given it to me on my return voyage. And they analyzed it and they said it was the purest grape juice they'd ever seen in, in anywhere. But there was no way to um, rate it as being grape juice. It tasted like grape juice, but it was too pure. Um, they said, where did it come from? And I said, um, wherever I went. <laughs> and so they analyzed it, and they, they tried to analyze the, the, the container it was in, and they said, there is no metal like this anywhere on Earth. So he definitely went somewhere, you know, so the, 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 the recording is factual, the recording is real, he's not making it up, he went somewhere, <laughs> obviously. They said, it, it, whether it was in, into a planet, into a spaceship or what, he went somewhere. We know that, but we don't know because we can't analyze this metal. And they tried cutting it, it wouldn't cut. They tried, you know, with a blowtorch, didn't even get hot. <laughs> and how are you privy to these tests? You're 12 years old. Yeah. And they're saying they can't cut it, they can't do it. How did that information come back to you? Well, it wasn't that they came back to me. After the initial uh, briefing, they took me and my father, adopted father, to a facility at the base. Which base? Uh, Shepard Air Force Base. It's located in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Of course, it's now a uh, commercial airline place now. It's not even a military base anymore. Uh, not an Air Force base anymore. Uh, it's now a commercial Shepard Field or Shepard uh, Airport or something like that. Uh, last I heard. Um, but at that time, it was a military base and they took me into this laboratory along with all the stuff they'd gotten out of my knapsack. They even, there was even a flower in there that they couldn't recognize. <laughs> An orchid. Um, it had, they said, this, this flower was, they'd never seen it before. They asked a, 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 a plant specialist to analyze it. He says, I've never seen one before. I can't, there's, there's nothing to reference it to. You know, it's just not. And uh, the, the funny part about the thing was that the flower was in a uh, uh, small pot or pottery thing. And when they analyzed it, they said, this thing is talking. This thing is singing. You know, this plant is singing. So it was a potted orchid. It was a potted orchid. And they in a, in a and it was it was singing. Singing. Yeah. You know, what was it singing? It was just singing. Uh, nothing in particular, just a, like a, a tone uh, or a, a sound. And they had machines on it, and it was making these sounds, and it was they were picking up on it. Now you also said it was talking. Were they conversing with the, the flower? Is, no, it was like it was like it was more singing, talking, um, communicating um, on their on their their machining these machines that they had that were, hooked, that were hooked up to it. It was like uh, the needle was, you know, dancing so to speak. They said it's like it's ma it's making a, a sound, and they were picking up on it and they were recording the sounds. They said this 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 plant is alive, you know. Obviously, it was alive, but it, I think maybe conscious. it has consciousness, and they it just they just couldn't <laughs> they couldn't comprehend it. Um, but that's the way it was. So, and so, getting back to the question about how you came into this information, just so, yes. so I'm clear, it sounds like 
somehow you got brought back to this Air Force base. Yes. With your adopted your, father. Your adopted father. Was your adopted father Air adopted? Force? So how did the so the material had to have gone from the uniform police who mm -hmm. taken the recording and, and confiscated the container with the grape juice in it in this metal that they don't recognize the right. and the whole bit. It got turned over to the Air Force. Yes. Who made that? I wonder who made that decision. I mean, how it was a get, how it was a gentleman that was stand, sitting st sitting there. He had a uh, he wore dark rim glasses. He had a, a white mustache, white beard, or uh, actually gray and like salt and pepper. And uh, he announced himself as being uh, J. Allen Hynek. Was this the day that you'd returned? Yes. You, so it wasn't just the uniform police, it was also this? It was also this scientist okay. was there. Does he have a connection with the Air Force? He was connected with them, yes. So you were gone for six months. How do you suppose that he got involved? What, what's the connection? Because your father was in the Air Force that yeah. he, he was brought in? Right. Was your father a, a high-ranking individual? He was a major. Major? Okay. What was his specialty? He was in charge of uh, aerial phenomenon. Okay. So that, that's the connection right there. That's the so, connection. So he's already kind of programmed to think in terms of you being abducted. Yes. Right? So that's how that came. So here you are, they've got the same plant. Yeah. Right? You're there. Yeah. Did you get to see the plant same connected up to all these devices? Yes, I did. What happened next? Well, it's sort of like um, I walk over to, I walked over to the plant and put my hands on it about next to it. And it stopped singing. Uh, stop giving this uh, this uh, vibrational thing out of, out to this machine. And they said, "What did you do?" And I said, "I just told her to be quiet. <laughs> it's going to get in trouble." <laughs> and it went silent. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it stay, stay silent? Did it start singing again? Mm, uh, it stayed silent from the, for the rest of the time that I was there in the laboratory. <laughs> what was the response from the people in the lab? They said, what do you mean? You told them to be quiet. <laughs> Were they happy? Were they sad? They weren't happy about yes. it. They weren't. They weren't happy about it. It was sort of just sort of like a, I turned a switch off on this plant. <laughs> well, that and you also kind of showed your hand too. Yeah. You could do. Yeah. A little bit. Beginning. And I had to I had to be real real careful at what I did, but and um, but I also I realized I, I knew then that I was different, and um, my adopted father then realized I was different. Um, but uh, he was uh, uh, he was saying that um, why oh you, you you told us that you didn't remember but yet you told this plant to be quiet there must be something there you know how could you how can you tell a plant to be how could you tell this plant to be quiet? How did you do that? So this <laughs> you know? is your father talking? Yeah, my adopted father he said, How did you do that? At the base later on? Uh, right there in the laboratory. And I said, I just sent a message to it. You know, he said, Well you didn't say anything. And I said, No, I didn't say anything. I, I thought it. And it responded. So, here you are, 12 years old, you're at this base. Yes. How did, so what happens next so in your life as you move forward? What happens next? Well, from the, at, the t at that time, I um, was, um, my sister had already returned home, so that's, that's past. Okay, so where's home for your sister? Hollowworth. How did she return home? She sent out a message, a telepathic message, that she was in danger. 
and I told her to send a telepathic message home. Why was she in danger? She had been sold to another uh, Air Force family. Sold. How does that work? Well, how does that work? Well, <laughs> I don't know how that works. I, I, myself, I, I really don't know how that works. Um, it was, it was little, my adopted father told us that he couldn't afford to keep both of us and that one of us had to go. So it was both you and your sister were adopted at the same time? At the same time. parents? Yes. And your father sold your sister to another... To another Air Force family not to be that crass, were well off. Not to be crass, but what, do you know what he asked? What kind of money he got for that? A million dollars. A million dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, so your sister sold this other Air Force. How, how soon after being sold to this other Air Force family was she rescued or picked up her ticket? When she turned the age of uh, nine, we were twin twins, so we were the same age. But you were 12 when you got picked up and all this stuff happened. Mm -hmm. so but before that was when she w went home. Okay. So we're talking... Prior, prior to that, yes. So after the lab experience. Yes. You, know, you, you mentioned about your sister being sold. Yes. Okay. She was nine mm -hmm. at so that, that time. That, that had already happened. Right? That had already happened. Yeah, so yeah. moving forward, so now your life is going to change. My life changed drastically from that point on. I was, um, I won't go into that too much because that's a part of my life I don't want to think about. <laughs> but it had to do with child abuse. So I didn't want to get into that. I'm, I won't go into that. Okay, that's fine. But, um, so, <laughs> anyway. Uh, want to talk to my dad? <laughs> yeah, no, let's go back, to, let's go back to origins. Origins. Oh, but we were talking about mission before. We wanted to get to, because you said you couldn't, you didn't know what your mission was. What, right. You couldn't remember at the time. Right. Um, you want to talk about what your mission is now, or you want to talk about your origins? My mission, uh, even at that time my mission was, but of course I didn't realize it. Um, my mission at that time was to give forth the information that Admiral Byrd was not allowed to give out when he was re when he returned to the surface back in 1947 he was told by the uh, delegation of the council of the hollow earth uh, given a message to give to the world and he went and came and when he returned back to washington they uh, interviewed him with top security forces and they ordered him to remain silent on all that he had seen and heard on behalf of humanity. And he said, this is, this is crazy. Uh, this message is for the world. It's not just for us. And they said, well, we'll see to it that you can't. And they locked him away. Did they? They locked him away for a couple years. And then after, upon his release and uh, 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 being told that he will not talk about this to anyone, not even his immediate family. He was released from the military. Now, you are a retired Air Force Colonel. Yes. Age 12, your mission, you know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Can you take us from age 12, you know, what transpired, you know, career-wise, how did you work yourself into position were you to be in uh, area got, 51? Got, got your commission. How did you get into that whole <laughs> area? Uh, how did you get to come to work for Area 51? Well, Admiral Byrd's uh, flight log. Okay, well, first off, I was born <clears throat> both. How do I put this? You know what the term hermaphrodite is? Yes. I was born both female and male in one body. And my adopted father was, uh, I'll go into a little bit, I won't go into the, 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 the nitty gritty of it, but he was a pervert, pedophile. And he would um, use me as a, a sex doll from age six to 10. So that's 
the part that I, I don't want to go into detail with. Sure. But he, it was, I, it was his influence that got me stationed um, at the Pentagon after I went into the service. I graduated high school at age 12. And that was, come, I, I think it was more of a fluke that I graduated because at that time when I was, I was in school, back then they didn't have what they have today. They didn't have algebra. They didn't have trigonometry or, or physics or anything like this. It was adding, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's it as far as mathematics. And then you have your English and spelling and all this other stuff. Um, so it really wasn't as complicated as it is today. So high school was basically easy for you. To yeah, at back age, then, at age, 12. at age 12, it was easy, you know. And I knew all the answers. It's like I saw the, these these papers were put down on my on a, on a desk in front of me. I had went to my uh, adopted brother's school, and I was waiting for him to finish his class so I could we could go home. And he was taking his final exams, and I sat down on this desk in the back of the room. This kid walks over and drops these papers on my desk and, and goes on about his business. And I looked at him, and I knew all the answers, so I answered all the, que the questions. And uh, come to find out, I had maxed the test. So at the, at the graduation ceremony for my adopted brother, I'm sitting in the audience along with everybody else, and my brother comes down and says, they want to talk to you. And I said, why? He said, because they want to talk to you. You should come with me. Okay. The educational board okay. uh, at the high school. So they took me back behind this curtain, and they said, you're Billy. And I said, yes. And they said, why aren't you in robes? I said, what? And they said, why aren't you in graduation robes. I said, because I'm not in high school. <laughs> I'm in junior high. And he says, no, she graduated high school. <laughs> I said, what? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> so they, they kind of hold my, my principal, which was in the audience, watching his son graduate. And they got him back there and they said, we've got an issue here. And they said, what's the issue? Well, this child is graduating high school but he hasn't graduated junior high yet they said well he has now <laughs> so they said how do you know and then i said well he maxed the test valedictorian so you have to give a speech the, the test <laughs> No, hang on a second. So I'm trying to understand. It sounded a little bit to me like, maybe I misinterpreted. Yeah. Put a test in front of you. Yes. It was. It was a test to see if you could you could get a GED, basically what they would call today. Uh, well, at that time, it was the final exams for high school. So how did? But your brother gave it to you. Was it your brother's test? Was it? No, he didn't give it to me. A kid walked up and dropped them on my desk. A kid. That I was. I was sitting in the back of the room. Oh. Waiting for my brother to finish the test oh. so we could go home. Oh, so you were in there as the test was being given. Yes. And you took it as well. I took it as well. <laughs> and I knew the answers, so I answered all the questions. And they you graduated were, high school. They graduated high school. school. I maxed the test. And they said, well, how do, you, how do we know this person maxed the test? They said, well, give it to her again. So they gave me the test again. Right there, behind the, behind this, uh, put me in a desk, gave me, put the test down in front of me. I answered them again, same thing. They looked at it and they said, "Is that is that 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 convince you?" He says, "Yeah." So now we're going to have to get. I'm going to have to run over to the, the to the junior high school, get another certificate of graduation, so we can do this legally. <laughs> So. <laughs> so I'm trying to follow the sequence of events here. So it sounded like you took this test. There had been some time that elapsed between the time that you took the test and the graduation. Yes. It sounded like you were at the graduation ceremonies. Yes. And they called you back there. Yes. At what, time, at what point was the second test administered? 
It was administered and when they took me back behind the, the curtain. You knocked it out behind the curtain during the ceremony? During the ceremony. This is what you're telling me. I did it in 10 minutes. Amazing. Okay. So I answered all the questions in 10 minutes. It, it, it was simple. So I knocked it out. Uh, so, okay, fine. So I'm up there and I'm there. I had to give a speech. And the speech that I gave on was how to be harmonious. And how to live a harmonious life. And it just, <laughs> it, it wasn't a dry eye in, in the auditorium after that. <laughs> but you also said you were a valedictorian. You had to give the speech. So, yes. So and, but see, the thing is, I didn't have anything prepared because I was, you know, it was just off the top of my head. But so the, so I'm, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is, yes. is my idea of what a valedictorian is today. Yes. They've gone, they're four years of high school, three years, yep. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They've got all these grades, they add up the grade point average, they come up with whoever's got the highest GPA, mm -hmm. you know, and whatever extra curricular or whatever involved yeah. in determine who the valedictorian is. All you did was take a test. I took a test. I mean, they deemed you a valedictorian. Yeah, because I maxed it. Now, do you get uh, do you get any kind of little sticker on your diploma from high school that says valedictorian? I had to find that. Yeah, love to see it. I had to find that. Um, so moving on. So you graduated valedictorian, delivered your some harmonious uh, harmonious speech. Yes. And uh, after that, I got my certificate of graduation. And a week later, I went down to look, went out to look for a job. Okay, so where did you, was this, what was the first place you went to look in? Um, on, the first and only place I went was a, a Ben Franklin Five and Dime. You know, Five and Dime store? Yeah, yes, I know. You, you probably dime. know sure, ben, yeah. ben Franklin. Not, not Ben Franklin Five and Dime. You no? Know? No. No? Five and Dime, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Okay, well, the, this is the Ben Franklin Five and Dime. And this was in Smyrna, Tennessee. So um, I went ahead and went in there and I said, I'd like to apply for a job. How old were you at that time? Twelve. Twelve. But weren't you in Wichita, Kansas? Wichita Falls before that. Okay. And we, we moved from, Wich from Wichita Falls to uh, Smyrna, Tennessee. Okay. So there was a transfer, I guess your father yeah. transferred over? Yeah. You got transferred to. Uh, um, uh, Seward Air Force Base, which is located in Smyrna, Tennessee. Okay, so that explains how you're placed in Tennessee. Yeah, he was he was transferred to uh, Seward Air Force Base. So while we were there, he uh, we, we continued our education, and um, so after this graduation ceremony went down to this with this uh, job and I filled out all the paperwork to become uh, employed. I left out the part about the age, just went ahead and filled everything else in and they, uh, the uh, manager of the Five and Dime story says, uh, oh you didn't fill in your age here, you need to fill that in. So I reluctantly filled it in and he looked at the age and he goes, 12? 12? You can't be 12. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm 12. Uh, uh, but you don't look 12. You look, you know, adult. You know, I said, I'm 12. So were you tall for a 12 years old? Uh, yeah, 5'7". Okay. 5'7", and... Um, Very shapely at that time. <laughs> um, and um, as you know, I'm, like I said, I was, grew up as hermaphrodite, yeah. so I, I had the female body sure. at that early age, but yet I was also, well, both. Right. Um, my measurements at that time were 36C2436. And I had long hair, mm -hmm. very long hair, down past my uh, uh, thighs. Um, but uh, and right next door was a uh, um, uh, recruiting 
uh, center for the armed forces. So while I was working, when, when, when went to, when, how I got to work for the Five and Dime was really funny. I'm, I'm sitting there and he says, 12, you can't be 12. I said, well, I am. Uh, can we get verification of that? I said, yeah, call me my parents. He called me my parents and they said, yeah, she's 12 years old. High school graduate. Oh, this is the smart kid, the one that graduated high school at age 12 and it had been in the paper too, you know, so. They said, well, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. So uh, they went ahead and let me go to work. And I was stocking shelves. So uh, not, nothing major stuff. And one day I walked over next door to where the armed forces was and um, walked in and I said, I'd like to go in the service. See about going in the service. So the uh, recruiter said, well, okay, uh, we'd like to give you a test, see what you qualify for. And uh, they didn't bother to ask my age or anything like that because I looked the part. You know, sure. you know, uh, and uh, they said, no, sure, uh, we'll give you a test, an aptitude test and see what, what you qualify. I took the test. And he goes, he checked the test out, took it in the back room, to had it tested, checked all the, came back out and he says, well, young lady, you qualify for anything you want, including officer, if you want it. <laughs> I said, oh, well. And uh, so I, I said, well, um, well, what's my next step? And he says, well, fill out these papers. So I started filling out these papers got to the age part and I filled out my age and he was all well he was real happy about it because I made such high grades and stuff right. in the in the aptitude test and he got to my age and he goes is it is this right <laughs> and I said uh yeah and no 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 you you can't be 12 tell me you're not 12 <laughs> I said I I'm 12 and they go but you can't be 12 we can't take you that early, <laughs> you know? And I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but that, that's my age, you know, and I, well, I got to talk to your parents. So I called my parents up and they came down. They said, yes, I'm, she's 12 years old, high school graduate. And he goes, oh my God. <laughs> so all the different services were there and they w they wouldn't touch me because of my age you know the army wouldn't touch me the marines wouldn't touch me the navy wouldn't touch me the air force said wait a minute you you you're too intelligent to get, get to get to just pass you by you know i've got we got to check this out you know, we've got to be we've got to be a way to do this so they contact washington and washington's uh, sent a representative down um, talked to me and talked, and checked out my scores, and they said, "We've got to, we've got to have this person." <laughs> you know? And so they said, "Well, would you consider going in at a later time um, and make an agreement that you'll go only into the Air Force?" And I said, "Yeah." So they said, "Okay, we'll uh, wait a couple years, and we'll take you then." and uh, with the uh, explicit, explicit permission of the, the parents. So that's what happened. So how old were you when you went in? I went in at, um, let me think, um, I was 12, and then, um, let me get my bearings right here, between 15 and 16. Okay. I did it again, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> but between 15 and 16, you know, that's, which is exceptional, actually. It is very exceptional. That's so did they, what kind of job did they give you in, in the Air Force? Well, see, when I was in the junior high, I was in ROTC. Okay. I went into ROTC, and I was I accelerated in that as well. Um, I got up to be in the, be in the uh, rank of lieutenant in the ROTC, so 
I had that behind me. And uh, then I went into the um, uh, went into basic training at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. When I got there, the drill sergeant, female, she said, "Okay, where's this whiz kid?" <laughs> so they pointed at me. She said, "Okay, you come with me." So I went with her. She said, okay, you're going to stay in my billet, my cubicle. I don't want any problems. <laughs> and the, because she knew I was transgender, you know, I knew I was both uh, sexes. Um, so she goes, uh, uh, I said, well, what's, she, what's the problem? She says, I don't want any, any of these girls coming up pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> because they knew, you know, she knew I was. Sure. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. All right. That had the the penis right. and the. So I said, okay, fine. You know, I'll stay in, in your cubicle, and we did for uh, the first uh, four weeks of training. After that, uh, the girls were wondering why I was not being with them. You know, sleeping in the same barracks and all that with them, and they questioned the the, the uh, drill sergeant, and they said because this person is different, this person is transgender, uh, hermaphrodite, and they said we don't got no problem with that. You know, and they said well, as long as there's no problems, fine. You know, I don't want nobody coming up pregnant. You know, and uh, so I said well, it's not going to happen. You know. So we, the last, uh, the last four weeks of training, I was with the girls, with just one of the girls. Um, at the end of uh, graduation, at the end, at the graduation, um, I was sent to OTS, which is Officers Training Candidate School Air Force. Yeah, OCS. And, and OCS is Army. Yes. So OTS the is the Air Force. Yeah. Uh, so I went into OTS. Um, strange that I, I didn't have uh, four years of college, you know, <laughs> to go into it. Okay, but yet I, so I'm still advanced, way it's advanced. Not required, though. You don't need to have that college degree to go into, at least in the army, the OCS. OTS either, um, but you have to have some schooling, mm -hmm. you know, some major, some college, some college, but not in this case because of my high, high grades on the aptitude tests that I had taken, I had qualified for everything, including the officer. Okay, so you went through the basic, and then you went to OTS. Yes. Which was like 90 days, typically? Um, no, it was more than that. Uh, more like eight weeks. Eight weeks, okay. Yeah, eight weeks of training. Okay. Um, so I think o OCS is eight weeks too, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it? I thought it was like 90 days. We have this no. 90 day wonders, they would call them. Oh, yeah, 90 day wonders. Yeah. Now, nowadays, yeah. it's 90 day wonders. <laughs> Back then, it was a lot a lot longer than that. It was like eight, eight weeks. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, they've got the ROTC in college these days. You'll go, that's four years. Yeah. You, know, you get a degree when you're done. And you right. Transition. Right, right. So, at the end of my, of my training, of course, the drill sergeants that are in there, too, had to salute you at the end um, because you're. An officer. Sure. But again, back to the 90, 90 days, that's three months. You mentioned eight weeks. That's two months. Eight weeks? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It is. Well, that's two months. But back then, it, but like I said, it was different than what it is now. Okay. So um, we went ahead and uh, went through this training. And they said, do you know where you're going? I'm going to Hawaii. I signed up for it. You know, I got a guaranteed letter saying I'm going to Hawaii. Watch the mic. Right. Guaranteed letter, I'm going to go to Hawaii. No, you're going to the Pentagon. Okay. <laughs> I, said, I don't want to go to the Pentagon. I want to go to Hawaii. They said, well, that's where they're going to send you. That's where they want you. That's where you're going. I said, oh, wonderful. So I end up in Washington. Now, are you cognizant of your mission at this time? Huh? Are you, are you aware of what your mission is? In the back of my mind, yes. yes but but not... Conscious kind of... Well, I, I, was, I, I didn't feel it was right to go on it yet. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the back of my mind, I was going, wait a minute, um, it's not, not the right time. Not the right time for it. I don't, I don't, I, at that time I, I knew that the world wasn't ready for it. For that information. So I went ahead and went into the, uh, the Pentagon. Got to the Pentagon, and as soon as I got into the Pentagon, they handed my uh, 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 a second lieutenant um, bars. That's the gold ones. And then, um, so the um, at that point, 